us in those songs. Thank you also, Steve, for leading us in the opening prayer. And thank you also, Kurt and Brandon, for the prayers for the Lord's Supper. And thank each one of you for being here. To have this opportunity for us to encourage one another and learn from God's Word together. I'm amazed at how unshakable some people are. How they can overcome or endure incredible obstacles and setbacks in life. And I think Paul was one of those people. He writes this to the church at Corinth. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He writes to the church at Corinth knowing how much Jesus loves him. And by keeping his focus on Jesus and the relationship that he had with him, the connection, he was able to build strength and resilience. And I believe steadfastness and zeal, courage for the Lord. He had a great loyalty to Jesus. In fact, when he writes to the churches of Galatia, he says, I've been, I've been, there's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You can see the relationship, the connection that he had there. And the life, what he endured how unshakable he was. An unshakable life. A thousand years before Paul, the psalmist describes an unshakable person. A person of integrity. It's in Psalm 15. And he gives a key on how to be in a, a person that can't be shaken. It's dwelling with God. He then describes the character of a person doing this. And he starts with a question and he ends with a promise. The first question is, the Lord who may live in your, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live in your holy hill. And then he says, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Never be shaken. And whenever you think about a person being shaken, you can think about slipping, tottering, falling, this idea of insecurity. Shaking speaks of a life slipping and sliding into times of calamity and being hopeless and helpless. Here's a visual story of how dangerous a shaken life can be. It happened to a teenager a few weeks ago in Georgia. She was there at Raven Cliff Falls in Georgia. And she stood about 150 feet above the bottom of the waterfalls and took pictures. And, and I guess she was focused on taking those pictures because tragically she lost her balance and she fell 50 feet and got stuck between two groups of, of rock. You kind of see it here. Face down. She was stuck there. Well, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story later. I'll come back to it. But that, that really is a visual picture of a shaken life and what can happen in a shaken life. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live in your, on your holy hill? Well, it's whoever does these things will never be shaken. Again, these are the first and the last verses of Psalm 15. There's a promise given at the end. Starts with a question. But the promise at the end indicates a secure life, standing firm and whatever, you face. A person that's never shaken. And so you can kind of see those as bookends in this song. It's only five verses, by the way. But the verse of the last verses are bookends in this song. And the song teaches traits for daily strength that come from God. Having security in life is a powerful promise, just as this proverb says for. A man cannot be established through wickedness, but the righteous cannot be uprooted. They cannot be uprooted. They can't be shaken. 
People need security in life. And this song has been used by notable people in history. They've used it. Two presidents. I want to give you an example of one going way back. This man, Thomas Jefferson, was asking. He, a person was in a difficult situation and he asked for advice from President Jefferson. This is after he was president. And what does he do? He turns to this song for the advice, for the answer. And he said, it's a portrait, Psalm 50, it's a portrait of a good man by the most sublime of poets, King David, for your imitation. Now, we often, all of us use sublime in our vocabulary every day, probably, don't we? Well, that was used by Thomas Jefferson years ago. I think he had a great vocabulary. So I looked it up, because I don't use it every day. And so he says, a portrait of a good man by the most sublime of poets. And sublime means of such excellence as to inspire great admiration. Admiration. That's what that means. FDR said on March 5th, 1938, during the Great Depression and impending war. This is, a, this is what he said, Thomas Jefferson. Now back to FDR. But he said this. I ask that every newspaper in the country print the text of the 15th Psalm. There can be no better lead for your story. March 5th, 1938. What were they going through at that time? Well, they were going through the Great Depression. And there was also some rumblings taking place on Europe. The Nazis growing in power. And war was, looked like it was coming. And so what did he do? He asked the newspapers to print this because it's about a good person. It's about good people. And we need good people, don't we? Now, that was asked, and I can't imagine that the president that we currently have would ask this of the newspapers to print this. But would they print it anyway? Well, it draws out an interesting question. Have you ever thought about being the guest of God? Well, that's what he's talking about here. The guest of God, the creator of the universe. We're going to be his guest. He talks about abide and dwell. Oh, Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? And it's the idea of a guest with the Lord. Who would be comfortable being the guest of the Lord? It's talking about not a visitor coming in, being uncomfortable, getting out of there as quick as they could. It's about being a permanent guest. Well, who would be comfortable with that? Well, that is what the psalm describes. One of the ways that they would keep this in mind is to sing. Let's turn to number Psalm number 15. That is one of the ways that they could do that, see, is to sing this psalm. And so you can see, here he's talking about dwelling. And the motivation for developing all these characteristics and character traits is to dwell with the Lord. And so wanting to do this, that's the motivation. And he starts off with the first description, first characteristic, and they all kind of fall. They all kind of define what being blameless is. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live? On your holy hill. He whose walk is blameless. And who does what is righteous. Who speaks the truth from his heart. And has no slander on his tongue. He wants to make sure that we understand what blameless is. First, notice blameless involves doing what is righteous. And when you look on the background of that word, righteousness means to be straight, to meet a standard, to be firm. In other words, stay within the boundaries or the lines. I've got a picture here of a downpour. 
Have you ever experienced one of those? You're, you're driving along and all of a sudden there's a big downpour. One time Debbie and I were driving up Interstate 35 and we knew that there was a big storm on the way and I don't have any peripheral vision. And um, so we pulled over, she got in the driver's seat and sure enough, here came the big storm. We got out there, she was driving, thankfully. But how you can do it is watch the lines. If you can see the lines, you can stay within that and follow them. And I can't imagine what happens if you get off of Well, you get in a ditch, you have a terrible wreck. And that's the way it is with many people. They don't have a clue as to how to have a good life. And so they get out of bounds, they get off the track, they get out of the, over the lines, and they end up with a disastrous wreck of life. And they're hurting themselves and hurting others. So what is genuine, blameless? What do they like? Well, no artificial coloring, no duplicity, no double-mindedness, no counterfeit truth. No wearing a mask, hypocrisy. It's integrity. It's another way of thinking about it, completeness. Now that word in integrity, the Hebrew word is used in 1 Kings 6, verse 22. And I'll highlight the word that uses it. You can see what it means, complete, whole, genuine. He overlaid the whole house with gold. And all the house was finished. There it is. Also, the whole altar, which was by the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. So the word finished is also the, the Hebrew word for integrity. And so it's easy to see the, the concept of complete, whole, genuine from the example. There was a college student in the dorm, I guess not realizing how much work it takes to study. She comes up with her, I mean, study, all of these assignments, homework, all that. She said, I've had it. I've had it. I don't think I'm going to be able to handle this. And when it comes time for the final, I'm just going to get someone else to do it for me. Take it for somehow, in other words, cheat. And of course, the roommate, she was very sympathetic, understanding about it. She said, well, what class is this? And she says, ethics. <laughs> Ethics. Biblical integrity gives benefits. The integrity of the upright guides them. But the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. The man of integrity walks securely. But he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Now, if you're walking securely, if you're a man of integrity or a person of integrity, You've got nothing to hide. There's nothing in the closet. But this person, the latter part of the verse, is taking crooked paths and it will be found out. We don't know when. But it would be. And there's also this about Christ likeness. We're starting off with this about blameless and, and righteousness. Jesus was that way. His enemy said this about teacher. They said, I don't, they were trying to flatter him, but what they said was the truth. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity. And that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. I think we all want the kind of reputation where people say of us, that's one person who doesn't just read God's word, but lives it too. That's how we are. That's integrity. That is on the road to being blameless. Well, part of it is not following, not just following these guidelines in life, but it has to do with your speech. And integrity involves your, your attitude, your, your view, what you say, what you do. It all works together. It's not a conflict within. And so speech is part of it. He wants to make sure that we understand what blameless is. Blameless people do what is right, including sincerely telling the truth. They don't slander people. They don't gossip about them. Remember, this is what he's saying. Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live in your holy hill? He whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue. Truth 
exists. Only falsehood has to be invented. And so two half-truths, they don't make the whole truth. Someone came up with this saying, in fact, beware of half-truths, you may have gotten hold of the wrong half. You've got to be careful. Proverbs 12, 22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who tell the truth, or people who tell the truth. Proverbs 16, 13, Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value a person, a man who keeps, who, tell, who speaks the truth. So we all value a person who speaks the truth. Paul adds in Ephesians, speak the truth in love. Speak it in love. And so another thing that we see in this proverb is how you're treating people. People can cast a slur with words and actions. People can demean, disrespect others by how they treat them. But a blameless person treats people with respect no matter their position in life. Who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord. Who do we admire? Who is it? You see, the blameless person, this person with kind of characteristic, will never be shaken. They honor those who respect the Lord. Well, there's a lot of people in the news, aren't there? Wealthy people, people with great power, do they respect the Lord? That's, her, that's where our focus needs to be. People who respect the Lord. He continues. Who keeps his own even when it hurts. Who lends his money without usury. Without interest. Who does not accept the bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Does a person keep their word even when it's not convenient? Even when it hurts? If they say they're going to do something, they do it. They keep their word. And what about money? What's the relationship with money? Is there greed? Is there wanting more? Is that the guiding principle? Or is it being willing to lend without interest? And in fact, Jesus puts it this way. He says, to lend, not expecting to get anything back. That's what he said in Luke 6, verse 35. So not only will a person who does commendable things dwell with God, but that person will not be shaken or rattled in life either. It's a sin to despise one's neighbor. But blessed are those who are kind to the needy. And so you remember that 17-year-old girl? It's a sin to despise one's neighbor. What she got, what she deserved. She was out on the edge, on the ledge there, taking pictures, not watching what she was doing. She fell 50 feet. The bottom was 150. Well, how, how would we look at that? How does a blameless person look at that? What would blameless people do? They would help. And she was helped. Georgia Search and Rescue Task Force was called and arrived at 5.20 p.m. From what they could see, the situation looked grim and out of reach. Using their grit and determination, two rescuers descended to her position at 6.50 p.m. That's 90 minutes later they were able to get there. They worked tirelessly to free her from the rock crevice and succeeded at 11, 11 16 p.m. Imagine being stuck between rocks for more than six hours. It was more than six hours. More like eight. And can you imagine that water rushing underneath you there and you're stuck there? Wow. That is a good example of a shaken life. We want to be the unshakable there. No one who is at home with God will take advantage of the poor or needy. 
He who does these things will never be shaken. He who does these things will never be shaken. Psalm 15 are the qualities of a person who can't be shaken. God gives lists. And some of these lists have to do with the behaviors that we have. Well, that's what they are, these lists. But some of them are behaviors that he hates. That he hates. There's an example. Things the Lord hates in Proverbs 6. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed tears of blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And a man who causes dissension among brothers. Well, that's what he does not like. He hates that. You can look at many lists. We talk about the attributes of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always hopes, always trusts, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's what he says. And we can see another one. Where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of us. And that's a fruit of the Spirit, see. Do I have the Holy Spirit? Will you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Another one is the, the Christian qualities. Peter writes about this for this very reason. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see all of those, all of these lists that he gives. There's one other I want to share with you. It has, has to do with our clothing. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love and binds them all together in perfect unity. So instead of thinking about a list of qualities that we must keep in order to keep our salvation, all these rules and regulations that we must keep or we lose our salvation. Let's remember they are attributes of Christ. Remember that. And here, here's, a, here's the truth. We are the body of Christ. And it's our privilege as the body of Christ to imitate the character of the head of the body, Christ. And so Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is, the, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. If we come up with this idea that, boy, I, I can't keep those lists. And then many other lists, too, of doctrine and things like that. I don't know if I'm good enough to be saved or to keep my salvation. Well, remember, it's not our goodness that saves us. It's the goodness of Christ. And our motivation should be to keep our focus, keep our focus, I'm getting ahead of myself, keep our focus on Jesus and on dwelling with God. Just keep that. All of it will work out then. Because the Lord is for us. And we're just striving to represent Jesus in our life. We're the body of Christ. We develop those, you know, to one degree or another. We all are, and that's where we all are. One degree or another. But we all continue to grow with them. 
and become more and more like Christ. So again, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it hurts, who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. That's his promise. Let's dwell with the Lord. Let's Develop those attributes of Christ. We're the body of Christ. But if you're if you've not committed your life to Christ, if you're not, if you haven't met him in the waters of baptism where he meets you as your master, your savior, and washes your sins away, and you're not part of the body of Christ. You can do that this morning. You can come to him or whatever might be your need. Once you come, as we stand and as we sing. Amen.